class with basic, um, you know, introductory to the class and how the class is going to work and, and so on. And we'll then spend the last half starting to get into uh, what makes for a Java application. Um, you, 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 you may notice we're in a, a little bit of an unusual room. Uh, the lectures in here are recorded uh, and I post them to YouTube. Um, that gives you an opportunity if you want to review something again, you can review it. If you're ill or you're out of town or whatever and you need to miss a class, you can always just watch the video. So I, I post them. Usually the lectures get posted, you know, later the, this evening. So by 10 o'clock, um, you know, you typically they're posted. If I am exhausted and I do not get them posted, um, then they'll be posted uh, the next morning. So if by the following morning, noon, you don't see the lecture, let's say, send me an email because maybe something went wrong or, uh, or, or whatever. So anyway, that's, that's why we're in here. Uh, you do have those little buttons uh, in front of you where you can push the button and it, the camera will zoom on you and your microphone will work so that you can ask a question. No one in any of the classes I've ever taught has ever pushed one of those buttons on purpose. People have like smashed their book up against it and pushed it or leaned on it. Yes. Yeah, right. Or said, what do these do? Right. But, but um, I will try to remember and, and remind me if I forget to repeat the question if, if someone asks me a question. Uh, all right. Let's start by taking attendance. I probably know about half of you and, and want to get to know the rest of you. Um, let's see. Patrick, the chat. Tico. David Karpinski. David. Johnny Kincaid. Michelle. Mm -hmm. Anita Phillips. Joey. Pen Penjawa. Pengawa. Matthew Ream. Ashley, Matthew Rydell, Michael Spith, and Thomas Strinsha. Strinsha. All right. Oh, there is an I in there. All right. I'm assuming all of you are at least somewhat familiar with using Angel that you've logged on to that. Is that incorrect? If there, you, you do, you have not never used Angel? Okay, what I can do is I can just very briefly run through that to you and if you have any further questions you can, you can get with me individually to see it. Angel is the course management system that we use here. So um, all the materials I have uh, for this course I put on Angel as opposed to distributing them via handouts and all that. that. That way if you lose it you don't have to go and find me or whatever if you miss a class. Um, the way that you access Angel is, the URL for it is angel.lorainccc.edu So the URL is angel.lorainccc.edu Once you get there, you'll get a screen that looks like this. And there's login instructions over here. Um, the LC ID uh, the, 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 the username is your uh, LCCC ID, which is your student number. So you put your student number in here. And your password is either your student number or the last four of your social security number um, or 000 or whatever you changed it to on a previous visit. So you can put that in and you can log in. And once you log in, what you'll do is you'll see all the terms that you've been here. Um, you'll, you, you, can, you can notice here that even though spring semester isn't a full day uh, uh, um, into it yet, I'm already way behind in all my classes, which is, you know, amazing. Uh, uh, but you'll see each of, the, each of the semesters, and so you should see the spring 2012, and you should see Java. 
All right. Now the rest of your screen is going to look different because you may or may not be enrolled in any other classes, but you should see under spring 2012 uh, Java. And then you click on that to get into the material. Most of the material is going to be on the content tab. All right. So that's where you'll go into to get most of this material. Other things like sending email and Dropbox and all that, if you have questions about uh, when you get to doing them, um, you know, let me know and, and we'll, uh, we can review them. They're pretty straightforward to do, but if you do have questions, uh, I can go over it. But I at least wanted to review it enough so that everyone can log on and, and see the materials for the class. Um, the materials I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, but I'm not going to go over in great detail. Um, I, I would leave that to you to, to read thoroughly, you know, to, to, to read it uh, completely. All right, in the getting started folder, there is our syllabus, um, a website for the textbook that has sample files and so on, and information about setting up your computer to do the assignments. Let's look at these um, one after another. Information on how to contact me is up here, along with my office hours. The office hours are not effective until next week, you know, so this week there really are no office hours for me. Um, in general, it's better to email me than to call me on the phone. Um, to, quote, uh, to quote what I've heard someone said, I have five different devices that tells me when I get an email. So if you want to get a hold of me, the better way to get a hold of me is via email. Um, if you're in a pinch and, and you don't have access to email or, or whatever, you can call and leave a message at that number. But I check those less frequently, so you probably will get a, a, a less, less rapid response if you send a voicemail as opposed to an email. Uh, you can either email me through Angel or you can just email me at the regular LC email address that's listed here. Um, as far as my office hours go, those are the ones I have listed. Now, this being an evening class, many of you maybe are taking evening classes because you uh, work during the day or are otherwise unavailable during the day. I, I do make, uh, uh, I, I can make other office hours available by appointment. Uh, so if those times don't work for you, I can arrange to be here at other times. In addition, one thing I do in this class is I offer you the opportunity to come and sit in on my other classes' labs. And I do that to all my classes. So we may on occasion get someone from another class in, in our lab uh, here, uh, you know, for this class. And um, if, if, so if you need extra help, you know, your first option is the office hours. The second option is to schedule an appointment. Another option is to find out when my other classes meet and you can come and sit in on one of those labs and get extra assistance. In addition, email is, is good too. I know some things, are easily discussed via email. Some things aren't. So um, the bottom line is, is you have a, a number of different opportunities to connect with me if you run into difficulties or questions. So really do one of them, all right, and if you're running into problems and, and we should be okay. All this stuff here is a more detailed description of the course. I urge you to read that um, down the line. I'll talk a little bit about the instructor's approach. Um, again, the thing to keep in mind is this is your class. I'm only here to help you learn the material. That's why I'm here, plain and simple. Which means if you don't understand something, it's important that you get it clarified by asking me um, during class or during lab or, or one of the other means that I mentioned. Uh, if you look around here, it's a relatively small class. There's probably 10 or so people. I think there's a couple extra people that, that aren't here today. but. Even so, around a dozen people, that's a pretty small class. And it's an old teacher adage that if you don't understand something and have a question, there's a good chance that there's other people that don't understand it as well. So, you know, by all means, you know, if you have a question, ask. If it turns out to be something that I think is better addressed one-on-one, -on -one, like maybe we talk about it during lab, I'll let you know. But 
Don't make that call yourself. Let me make that call. Ask the question and I'll do my best to answer it during the class if I can. Or if I think it's better to defer it to lab where we can sit down and look at it one-on-one, uh, -on -one, we'll do that. All right. Here's some general college policies you should run through just to be familiar with. Uh, late work. I am I'm more flexible about late work than many of my colleagues. Uh, but there's a couple catches uh, with that. First of all, um, late work, you know, one late assignment because you had the flu and weren't up, you know, up to it to, to finishing it up is one thing. But if you, if you find that you're continuously falling behind and you're never getting any of your uh, assignments in on time, that, that ought to be a signal that you need to, to approach me for extra assistance. All right, that's the first thing. You know, a late assignment, no big deal. Continual late assignments, that's, that's a way of letting you know that, that you know, you, you, need to, uh, you need to get some extra assistance on it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm more generous uh, as far as not deducting points for people that are working with me on, on a question. So, for example, you know, if there, if, a, if there was a program due today and you were in lab and you show me what you had and you asked me questions, if you still weren't done with it, and you turned it in tomorrow or the day after, I'm likely not to deduct at all. All right, because, hey, I knew you were working on it. You ran into a roadblock. Okay, you got past it. That's no big deal. Um, the people that I really don't mind deducting are people that simply just don't work on things until, until the last minute or, or, you know, towards the end of the semester or whatever and are turning in assignments that are really late with no real explanation and I don't see them or I don't hear from them or I don't get any questions from them. All right. So read through that um, to get a, a better sense of where I'm coming from on the, on the late assignments. The bottom line is is that you know if you know I'm willing to work with with students, um, and students need to meet me halfway. As long as we do that, you should be in good shape. We'll we'll, we'll get through this one way or another. Um, your final grade is based on a combination of assignments, a midterm, and a final. You'll have approximately 15 assignments, so a weekly assignment, smaller weekly assignments, each worth three points. And then you'll have a midterm worth 25 points and a final worth 30 points. And that should add up to 100. Um, assignments will typically be one week assignments. I may in some cases combine two into one. So instead of having one week to do something, you might have two weeks to do something a little bigger and the points will, will correspondingly be adjusted. Um, that's my plan. Now, as we all know, plans don't always work out. So if we deviate from that and we do not have that, I will prorate it so whatever points are possible scale to 45 points. So for example, let's say we uh, only had 14 assignments at three points. That's 42 points uh, total possible. I'd multiply whatever points you had by 45 over 42 and that'll give you your, your 45 uh, points worth of stuff. So I prorate it if it doesn't end up to be exactly that. Here's the schedule. Um, as far as um, what we're going to cover in this class. I will say towards the end of class we cover some additional topics that aren't really in the book. Um, and, and when we, we deviate a little bit from the book towards them, the first few, first part we, we follow the book uh, a little closer. My notion is, is that you'll get more from both reading the book and attending the lectures that you'd get from either by themselves. All right? So consider it to be two sources. Sometimes the book explanation may be hard for you to understand and, and hopefully my explanation will pick up the slack. Sometimes it might be the other way around. I might talk about something that seems confusing, but when you see the examples in the book, maybe that will flesh it out for you. So I think it's a good idea to read the stuff prior to coming to class and uh, hear the lecture. And, and that the hope is, is that those two things together will lead to a, a good understanding of the material. All right, I do expect you to read the syllabus. Um, there are professors that's, that have buried in a paragraph in the syllabus that if you send me an email with 
such and such sec, uh, subject line that you'll get two extra credit points. I'm not saying if I'm one of those people or not. Actually, I will say I'm not. But there are other professors that do. So it, it sometimes pays to read your syllabuses. All right, or syllabi, I should say. All right. Here is the textbook website. <coughs> I don't like how Angel handles links. Oh. There we go. Click on that. Oops. Um. But you, let's see. Hmm. Not sure if you have to register or what. You might, uh, there, there might be a URL in the book. Oh, get code. There we go. You can download the code for the class. Um, they probably mentioned the URL in the book. That, that way, if you want to play along with the examples in the, in the book, uh, you can. All right. Next. Setting up the computer to do the assignments. This is something that's important. I would, I would imagine this would be one of the first things that you would want to do, um, is whatever computer you're running, um, you want to make sure that you have uh, the, the Java development kit uh, properly uh, installed and that you can run. Uh, you know, we'll go over a Hello World application today and, you know, make sure you, you know, uh, it would be ideal if by next class you make sure your computer is configured to do this. Now, depending on the platform you have, it may already be installed. It might not be and you might have to uh, install it. Uh, I can assist you with most platforms, if you have questions uh, about that in, in terms of setting it up, and there's some materials uh, in here as well. And yeah, it, it mentions the page in the textbook. This class is, is a little odd compared to many of the programming classes insofar as we don't use an IDE, at least not at first. Our coding is done strictly in a plain old text editor. By the end of the term, we might use uh, an IDE, you know, if the class is good and, and behaves themselves. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I really think it's a case that um, it, it, it's, I, I think, I think without using an IDE, you gain a deeper understanding of the stuff. You know, you're not just dragging and dropping stuff in. You actually have to know exactly how everything works and the nuts and bolts. And some of you may have had me for, for the web development class, and I'm the same way in that. We don't use Dreamweaver or anything like that. We just use a plain old text editor. And I do that here because I think it's really important to do that. Um, we may at the end of the term, just so that you have some exposure to that as well, do an example or two using an IDE as well. So, um, all right. So, that's something you probably want to do fairly quickly uh, is make sure you have that. You know, you do have lab, all right? You do have a, an hour lab each of the two days or a 50 minute lab to be more precise. Uh, but that isn't necessarily going to be enough to do the assignment. So, it is expected that you work on them uh, outside of class. And again, you can come in here. Uh, and, and, the, and everything should be configured properly. But you likely want to have this configured on your machine. The one thing uh, I do want to mention is the Java Developers Kit is different than the Java Runtime Engine. So, um, you know, sometimes people will say, I have Java on my machine, but I still can't do that. Well, it's important to distinguish, are you talking about the Java Runtime Environment or the Developers Kit? Because the Runtime Environment will allow you to run things like Java applications embedded on web pages or, or whatever. Whereas you need the Developers uh, Kit to compile and, and uh, run and, and create your own Java applications. All right. What I do uh, for the assignments is I have a folder for each assignment. 
that has uh, all for many of the assignments anyhow, I won't say all the assignments, but that has a written explanation and a doc file and we'll have the compiled Java code so that you can run it and see how it behaves. Sometimes it's not always obvious exactly what I mean and therefore I supply that to you. One thing that you'll notice is if you open up these zip files in Windows, you'll see some extra files because I created these on a Mac operating system, so it's sort of like ghost files out there. You really don't need these two. You just need the, the doc file and any class files I have. So you can actually bring that down and you can actually run that and see how, how the, the code should behave. Uh, you won't be able to see how the code works, you know, because you're, you're seeing the compiled code, but um, you will at least be able to see the behavior that I want. So you should take a look at that uh, lab. Um, I don't expect tonight we'll cover everything you need to know to do the lab. Um, you might, you know, look in the book. Uh, the two things, um, the two big things that we would need to talk about um, beyond the, the material that I plan on talking about today that we'll talk about on Wednesday uh, are arrays and a random number function. All right. Resources and examples are just things that I found. Um, here's an additional documentation about installing the Java JDK. In addition to the material that's in the book, you can download it. Either the, the the version 6 or version 7, doesn't really matter. Here's a nice little chart that will indicate what you need. But you can download the code from there. The Hello World uh, application explained, which we'll get to that in a, in a second here. Um, and that's about it. Lastly, we have a discussion forum. Um, that you can post uh, questions uh, between classes. Uh, consider emails to be talking to me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like pulling me aside in the lab and asking me a question. Consider the discussion forum being like raising your hand in class and asking a question that way where everyone can see what your question is and, and see my response to it. So, you know, um, consider it uh, accordingly. Are there any questions about this? Any of the, the, the kind of course logistics? Yes. The lab over here have all the. It, it ought to, yeah. Uh, you, you know, in theory, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you never know between semesters. Uh, you know what 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 could have happened, but yeah, if it doesn't, we will make sure that it will probably by next class. One thing uh, I would imagine probably many of you have worked on these machines. If you haven't. One thing to remember is these machines completely re-image themselves every time they're booted. So therefore, you can't keep any files on them. So, you know, don't save something and expect it to be there Wednesday. You know, you can email to yourself or, or uh, a thumb drive or even actually upload it to Angel. There's a place where you can upload it to Angel to keep it. But do make sure you have a, a copy of it. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Java. And... I think Java is a great language to, use, uh, to, to learn and to use. And I say this from a couple of reasons. First of all, it is relatively a, a high demand area. Um, it may less be a high demand area than a low supply area. All right? There's a lot of people that know the Microsoft technologies, but it's my experience that less people know the Java technologies. And as such, um, people that are skilled in Java you know, um, oftentimes have some very good opportunities uh, for them. It's good in general just to be exposed to a different platform and different language and all that. I know probably many of you have, have done Visual Basic programming or C Sharp or whatever, but it's good to have uh, another one. Java is a good language in my mind to really sort of cement object-oriented concepts, especially the way and the manner that we're going to code it uh, there. I, um, I worked in a number of different object, or I, one actually, uh, object-oriented platform before I uh, worked on Java, before I did any Java. 
And I will say, uh, I really didn't feel that I understood object-oriented concepts well until I had studied Java. That was, for me, sort of what really sort of cemented and, and made those concepts uh, really, really clear for me. So um, that's another good reason to learn it. I, I think it will really help you become a better programmer in general because you'll have a deeper understanding of uh, some of these object-oriented uh, concepts. Um, one big advantage of Java is that it um, is cross-platform. In other words, um, it doesn't just run on Windows. It can run on Windows or Mac operating system or Unix or Linux or many other operating systems. Ah, the last big advantage I forgot to mention, last big reason for learning Java, is it's the programming language of the Android platform. So as far as getting into mobile development, uh, it, it's, it's important uh, to know from that perspective. All right. Uh, again, the whole idea of Java and the whole philosophy of Java is that it can run cross-platform. Now that brings a whole distinct sets of advantages and disadvantages, right? The advantage, of course, is that it could run on multiple platforms. So in theory, at least, I should be able to write a program and deploy it to a Windows machine, an Android device, um, and so on. Now, whether I'm able to do that or not might be another issue, all right? There, there, there's always catches, right? This isn't a perfect world, and there's always some compatibility issues. But at least in theory, I should be able to take Java code and run it in several different environments. What's the downside of being cross-platform compliant, of being able to run something across many different platforms? What's the downside of it? Yeah. Yeah, for one, there could be compatibility issues. That's true. Is that the, uh, how, how do I want to say it? I'm not sure if that's a disadvantage or if that's just sort of a catch. You know, cross-platform is never completely cross-platform. There's always a potential for issues when you do that. Pardon me? Security, possibly. Efficiency. Efficiency, yeah, you know. Um, if something is geared and written to run on one particular platform, it can take some advantages of, of that uh, as compared to um, other, um, uh, other sorts of applications. I did post, uh, in the resource section, I did post about the difference between compiling uh, a Java application and compiling a, a .NET application. But let's talk a little bit about compiling a Java application. All right. First of all, what does compiling an application mean? What does that process do? Whether you're talking about Java or really any programming language. Yeah, it creates object code. All right. That might be a good place to start discussing. We have... source code and object code. Source code is the code that you, the programmer, writes. All right. In other words, this is what's written in VB or C Sharp or Java or anything. All right. Object code is what the computer executes. Traditionally, that's something that's called machine code. And if you ever study like assembly language program or, or, or machine language coding, it's something that's very long and, and complicated and arduous. Uh, you know, people don't really understand it. Oh, how do I want to say this? It's not easy for people to relate to. You know, um, it's easier for people to relate to, you know, x equals 1 than to relate to 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, you know, that sort of thing. All right? Now, that's the only language that computers really understand is, is the object code, is the machine code. All right? And yet that's very difficult for people to work with. So we have these languages that programmers can understand. 
VB, C Sharp, Java, etc. They get translated into the code that the machine can understand, the object code. Okay? And there's actually a couple ways it can happen. It can be compiled or it can be interpreted. But compiled is one way that that is done. With compiled, you take your source code and you produce an object code version of it. Interpreted languages actually translate one line at a time at runtime. All right, so it's a little bit different, different beast. We're interested in compiled uh, uh, languages here. And so we have our source code program. We run it through another program called a compiler, and that creates the object language that we can run. This is it for you know, a lot of different programming languages and a lot of different environments. The thing to keep in mind is this is going to be specific to a platform. All right. So depending on the platform, that's going to be different. You know, um, an EXE that you run on a Windows machine won't run on a Macintosh or won't run in Unix, all right, because it's written in the code that works on a Windows machine. All right. With Java, there's an intermediary step that comes in. And that intermediary step is what really allows for the cross platform compatibility. With Java, we have our Java code, which is our source code that the programmer writes in Java. And typically these files end in .java. All right. These get compiled to produce not true object code, but what's called byte code. And those are typically class files. Then the Java Virtual Machine, JVM, which is part of the Java runtime environment, takes this byte code and executes it. Effectively, it does the interpreting of that code into the machine language that can be executed. So how does this give us cross-browser compatibility? Well, as long as our machine has a Java virtual machine defined for it, we can take the byte code that we created through compiling and run the Java code on any platform. All right? Because we don't do as we do in this case to translate it into pure machine code. We, we sort of create an intermediary step and the Java virtual machine sort of handles the, 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 the translation of that into the actual machine code that gets executed. Now, the statement was made a couple minutes ago, one of the drawbacks of this, of efficiency. All right. Well, as you can see, adding an extra sort of step in that process, um, this code can't be optimized for any particular machine, right? It has to be generic code that will run on any Java virtual machine, which means that, again, there's a possibility for some inefficiencies to sneak in because of that. But, you know, nothing's for free. You know, the benefit of being able to write uh, a piece of code and have it run on a variety of different platforms, this is part of the cost that you pay for it. All right? Questions about this? Let's take a look at uh, the Hello World application uh, to give us a sense of what uh, a Java application contains. It's a very simple Java application. Uh, and then we'll go in and, and I will enter it in and we'll run it to see how we can uh, enter in and, and run our Java code. All right.
here is the hello world application. And I'm going to copy it and I'm going to post it in the notepad so I can make my comments about it. All right. And you can read their comments of it by going online and looking at this page and seeing a discussion. First of all, I mentioned before that um, Java is, is a, a, a relatively pure object oriented platform. That means that everything is a class. Okay? Everything involves a class. All your code lives in classes. All right, now there's different kinds of classes, there's different kind of code and all that, but all your code lives in classes. So that's why we see right here class Hello World app. That means that we're defining a class called Hello World app and here's what it is. Java uses the braces or curly brackets, all right, to indicate grouping. And it's important that they match up so that your code is grouped correctly. All right, this, this is one of the things that sometimes causes beginners a little bit of grief is they don't have these uh, uh, matching up correctly and their code either doesn't compile cleanly or uh, doesn't work the way that it expect. A key thing in Java code is, in my mind, is to have your code look neat. All right, you know, look at me, look at how I dress. Go out and look at my car. I'm not a neat person, all right? Yet, when I write code, I make sure that those brackets or those braces line up correctly. What do I mean by lining up correctly? Notice here, this brace lines up with the C in class. That indicates that this is the closing brace for this opening brace. And I can see that even if I don't, you know, back up and I can't even see, you know, read the words exactly. I can see and I can understand that that's that particular grouping. And I'll see students trying to debug code that looks like this. You know. And it's like, no wonder you can't understand the code. No wonder you're having difficulty, all right? That's really hard to tell what goes with what. Now, this is a small example, but if you imagine even a slightly bigger program, it'd be very hard to see what goes with what. So, we have our class definition. That's what this is. Every class, most every class, is going to have its own source code file. All right, not every, but most every is, uh, are going to have its own source file. And that's what I'm creating here. These lines are comments. All right, I, I should have mentioned those first. You can start a, a stretch of comments with a slash star and end it with a star slash. Everything between those it really is ignored by the compiler. It's just description for you to understand what the code is doing. We then start our source with the the class declaration, it says I have a class, this is the name. One thing about Java is that it is case sensitive. Therefore, notice the word class is in lowercase completely. If I put class with a capital C and try to compile it, I'd get an error. All right. By convention, class names have every word capitalized. So, hello world app. The H in hello, the W in world, the A in app are, are, are um, capitalized. All right. We'll talk more throughout the course of what is contained in the class, but a class essentially has attributes or methods. Or, or, I'm sorry, not or methods, attributes and methods. This particular example, this class has no attributes. It only has a single method. Think of method as meaning the same thing as a function. And the one function that this class has is the function main. All right. So, public static void is talking about characteristics of this function. 
And we'll talk about a couple of these. We'll leave the static part of it until later. All right. Public means that this function can be accessed from the outside world. All right. Static we'll leave till later. Void means that this function doesn't return a value. As you might know from some of your other programming experiences, functions oftentimes can return a value. You know, if you have a calculate gross pay function, it will return a number. All right. Functions don't have to return a value, and this particular function doesn't, so we say void. And then main is the name of the function. Now, every application that you create has to have at least one class that contains a main function. That function main is a special name. All right? It's sort of the function that gets the ball rolling in the application. All right, it's sort of the function that gets fired up when the application starts out. So you need at least one class in your application that has a main function. In the parentheses are arguments that you can actually pass arguments into your main function from the command line. Um, we may deal with that later on in the term. Um, you know, um, right now it's not really important. Then we have our braces that indicate the start and the end of the function. All right, so function, here's where it starts, here's where it ends. Class, here's where it starts, here's where it ends. Now, the good news is, is that you could forget everything I said about what all those things mean. <laughs> Just remember, you're going to have public, static, void, main, parentheses, string, args, in every application you write, there'll be at least one class that has that in. So you can just copy and paste that into each assignment that you do. There'll be one class that has that in there. All right? Because that's the, that's the function that gets the ball rolling. All right? Now, inside of this are the, are the, the statements that are going to get executed. And this particular function really only has one very simple statement. And that is to, to simply display the word, uh, uh, the, the phrase, hello world. The system out print line is actually a built-in uh, function, part of the, the, the Java, um, um, part of the Java API that we don't have to write it. it. It's written for us. And we can simply use that to output anything we want. And what are we outputting? We're outputting the message, hello world. We end the statement with a semicolon. The two slashes, again, indicate a comment. So comments can either be done as two slashes, or you can do a star slash, oh, I'm sorry, a slash star, and a star slash to do multiple line comments. If you use the double slashes from that point on in the line is assumed to be a comment. So in this case, this is a valid statement. The rest of the line, though, is a comment. Some people do it like that. I generally prefer, if I'm going to use comments like that, to do it like this. All right? Doesn't really matter, though, ultimately. All right. Questions about this? All right. This is our source code for just a very simple application that's going to write hello world. We have that. What are we going to do with it? First thing we're going to do is remember, at least to start, um, every class that we create is going to have its own, um, it's going to have its own uh, source file. And that source file is going to end in .java. Other thing about the source file is the source file should be named whatever the name of the class is. So, in other words, the source file for this class should be hello world app dot java. Okay? So I'm going to go and I'm going to save this. And I'm going to put it, I have a java folder here that I We'll put examples. I'm going to go change that to all files. And I'm going to call this 
hello world app, keeping the same case and the same everything, dot Java, with Java being lowercase. All right, I go and save that. Now we're ready to compile it and run it. Okay? So, to compile it, we need to go to the command line. All right? Ooh. How many of you have used the command line at least at one point in your life? Just about everyone? Um, if you haven't, you can go in to, uh, in Windows, you go in, it's called Command Prompt. You can access it through accessories. Really, the main thing you need to know are just a handful of simple commands. All right, the first of which is to get into the folder that you created, uh, and mine is simply called slash Java. So I can say cd, change directories, slash Java. And before you moan about how hard it is, this is how we did it all the time back in the old days. In fact, all right, if you really moan about it, I'll bring down a, a stack of punch cards and we can really talk about how it was hard back in the old days. All right. So to do this for one class isn't that big a deal. All right. I usually go CLS to clear the screen. All right. And a DIR shows me a directory listing. So CD to change directories, DIR to see a directory listing, CLS to clear the screen. Here, that's CISS 125 in, in three minutes. All right. Now you notice that I have hello world app.java there. Now I'm ready to compile it. How do you compile it? You type in Java C and then the name of your source file. So Java C hello world app.java. Hit return. It thinks about it for a while. And the fact that it didn't display anything indicates that it compiled it cleanly that there were no errors. All right? If there were problems, it would give us a whole list of, of error messages. But the fact that there's nothing between there and there is actually good news because that indicates that no errors were found. Now remember, that's just compiling it. That's not executing it. What we've done is this step. I don't know why that's so dark. But what we've done is this step. We've written our Java program and we've compiled it into the bytecode, which is a dot class file. All right. So if I do a DIR, I'll see uh, there's now a hello world app dot class along with the hello world um, dot Java. If you were to look at that dot class file, it would be not intelligible to, to a person. All right, you wouldn't be able to, to see what's going on. Now, how do we execute this? We can execute it by typing in Java and then just the name of the class that has the main in it, which in my case is just the one class. So I type in Java Hello World app. It runs and goes and says hello world. All right, so it completed. Now, what are the key things that I want you to take from this part of it? First of all, everything's a class. Every, all your code is going to be in a class. Grouping is done via these curly brackets. The code is case sensitive. At least one class in your app needs to have a main function. You will save your, uh, and the, the, the declaration of the main function should look like this. You will save your source code in a file named whatever your class name is dot Java. You can compile it by typing in Java C and the name of the source file. You can then run it by typing Java and the name of the class file. Um, if you can repeat these steps and create the Hello World application uh, and repeat these steps, you know, you're in good position for today. So that should sort of be your goal, whether you do it at home or you try it uh, today in lab. All right. Um, I did want to just do 
you know, a couple, you know, just make a quick error just to show you how that would look like. If, for example, I forgot and put class in with a capital C, it blows up and actually gives me three errors, interestingly enough. And it kind of tells me what I did wrong. It says it's expecting class, and I gave it class. And if I look closely, I see that that's uppercase and that's lowercase. All right. So I can know to correct it. But that's what you'll see if you get an error. You'll get a list of these errors. And it kind of points to where the error is, but not really. All right. Remember, this is a machine. Uh, the machine. Uh, only knows, you know, that you violated some rules that it has built into it. It, it doesn't have the judgment to say, hey, you, you misspelled class wrong. You know, you spelled class wrong. All right. Any questions? Um, normally I post my examples, but I do want you to go through the process of creating this and compiling it and, and running it yourself. So I will not post the Hello World example. It's easy enough to create. You can just view that page that I have and even copy and paste it in there. But I do want you go, to go through the exercise of creating the file and, and running it from the, compiling it and running it from the command line. All right, that's it. We'll see you up in lab.